I'm David Weinstein, and it's a great honor for me to present some of my research related to Japan's economy, past, present, and future. Before I begin, I want to give a quick overview of the topics that I'm going to be talking about today. One of the big ones is what explains Japan's long-run historical economic successes and failures. Secondly, I want to address the Japanese economy in an international context and spend some time talking about success stories and challenges for the future. Third, I want to end up by talking about Japanese strategies for the future. And in particular, I want to talk about education and globalization and how they've affected Japan and how Japan might leverage these things to promote growth in the future. Uh, I also want to talk about how Japan might improve productivity and services and also talk about women in the Japanese labor force. When I teach my course on the Japanese economy, I always begin with this map of the world, which shows GDP per capita in 2020, and each country's color corresponds to its income level. So countries that are marked in dark blue have per capita incomes that are above $40,000 per year, and countries with lighter shades have lower incomes. When you look at this picture, you can see that there are three classes of high-income countries. The first class are English-speaking countries, uh, such as the United States or Australia uh, or England, and countries that are close geographically to England. The second class of rich countries are what I would call petrostates, that is countries that have large amounts of oil, uh, such as Saudi Arabia. And the last class of rich countries are Japan and its pre-war colonies. Now, there's been a lot of work that's been done on why places like England became rich during the Industrial Revolution. So we sort of understand what is going on there. We also understand why it is that countries that are endowed with large amounts of natural resources tend to be rich, like Saudi Arabia. But it's much less clear what went right in countries like Japan. So one answer that people have often given to this question is maybe there's something special about Japanese culture. Economists think that this is unlikely because historically, Japan was a very poor country. So one example of this is that Japanese wages at the end of the Edo period were only about 15% of those in Britain. So if you thought that Japanese culture were import was important, for standards of living, you should expect that Japan should have always had high levels of per capita income, but we don't see that in the data. Uh, instead, what we see is that Japanese growth is punctuated by three critical transitions that each involve a fair amount of globalization. So the first of these transitions happened a long time ago uh, in the Asuka period, and I call it the Asuka transition. And that's associated with Japanese people learning to read Chinese. And when they learned to read Chinese, they were able to absorb Chinese uh, science and technology and religion and culture uh, very easily. The second big transition uh, happens about a thousand years later in the Meiji period, when the Japanese learned to read technical in English. And I'm gonna spend some time talking um, in detail about that transition. Uh, and then we have a third big transition, uh, which is the World War II transition that happens uh, immediately following the Second World War, when uh, Japan globalized uh, by adopting um, 
uh, modern forms of democracy, and also um, uh, globalized by having a large number of Japanese who are living abroad come back to Japan. Uh, more recently, we have a more negative transition um, in which Japan has shifted from being a country that is converging with uh, the United States and other high income countries uh, to being a country that is actually diverging from those countries. And I'm going to finish up my talk uh, speaking directly about what I think uh, has been the problem since 1990. So let me first begin by talking about this Asuka transition um, in which Japan or the Japanese began to read uh, Chinese texts. And I'd like to just give you a sense about how big a transition that was by just showing you two pictures of uh, artwork before and after uh, this transition. So on the left, uh, I'm showing you some Haniwa dancers from around the year 500. And on the right, I'm showing you uh, the Asuka Daibutsu. Uh, and what you can see is that is that the technology needed to make something like the Asuka Daibutsu is dramatically superior to uh, the kinds of technology that were being used in the early uh, earlier periods in Japan. The styles look very different. And in fact, uh, when we tend to think about Japanese art, we tend to think about the picture on the right much more than the picture on the on the left. Now, one of the interesting features of, of uh, Japanese economic development is that for very long time periods, while population grew in Japan, uh, per capita incomes did not grow very much. And indeed, uh, standards of living for the typical Japanese person in at the end of the Edo period were not that different than standards of living uh, at the, uh, in the Nara period. Um, which brings us to uh, the next big transition that happens, uh, which is the Meiji transition. Uh, now the Meiji transition is obviously also uh, very heavily influenced by learning from abroad. Uh, and I want to, um, give as an example uh, a name of someone who may not be that well known uh, to many people. Uh, his name is Kanda Takahira. Uh, and he um, translated an economics textbook in the 1860s, actually before the, the Meiji Reformation, Restoration. Uh, and in translating economics, he realized that Japan could finance its development through a land tax and he realized that the superiority of a land tax was that it didn't have the same economic inefficiencies as rice taxes did. And Japan implemented this in 1873. And shortly thereafter, we see uh, that Meiji government expenditures almost doubled uh, uh, as a result of this land tax. And Japan was able to finance its economic development. Um, and this is just a very simple example of how learning modern technology, modern economics uh, helped transform the Japanese economy. Um, one of the other things that Japan did uh, in the early Meiji period, as, as many of you know, is that they invested enormously in education and uh, uh, schooling of their population. Um, Japan uh, realized early on that learning required three things. The first was that they needed really good teachers or professors in their universities. And Japan invested heavily in getting foreigners to come to Japan and teach in teach science in particular in their in their universities. Secondly, Japan invested heavily in literacy and the Japanese population um, rapidly became literate. But the third innovation uh, we see much less frequently in the world, in fact, I would argue we've never seen anything like it, uh, is that the Japanese invested uh, enormously in translation technologies for scientific books. 
Uh, so that it wasn't just having good professors and students, but they realized that they also needed to have um, textbooks that students could read in order to innovate. Um, these kinds of expenditures uh, were quite large. And I'm just showing in this, in this graph uh, what happened to the Ministry of Education budget uh, during the 1870s. And you can see that uh, education expenditures essentially uh, went up by around uh, 20 times uh, between 1868 and uh, the middle of the 1870s. Of that increase, about one third uh, was spent on foreign professor salaries. So this is a really large investment in education. I also want to show you some, some data on what happened um, to uh, the ability of Japanese to read science. Uh, and here I want to share some research I've been doing with um, uh, Rekha Juhach and a graduate student of mine, uh, Shogo Sakabe, uh, in which what we did was we went to the National Diet Library and we scraped uh, the books uh, that, it, that, that were in the card catalog and put together a database of every uh, translated scientific, uh, where here, uh, what I mean is a technical book, uh, so books related to uh, engineering, agriculture, business, uh, between 1500 and 1910. Uh, and one of the striking features of this plot is that uh, between eight, 1500 and 1852, only 10 books on engineering, agriculture, and business were translated. So if you were a Japanese person in 1852, and you knew about uh, Western technology from maybe the Dutch or, or Chinese, um, and you wanted to read about it in Japanese, uh, you had almost nothing to read. Uh, what is also quite striking is that in the 17 years um, between the arrival of the Americans in 1853 and 1870, only three more technical books were translated into Japanese. So uh, again, a Japanese entrepreneur in 1870 who might have realized that steel or textiles was an important industry would not have been able to read any books um, uh, to instruct him on how to set up that type of factory. Uh, however, we see a very marked break around 1871 in the number of translated books. These rise quite rapidly um, after 1871. Um, and we actually know something about who is doing these, these translations. 80% uh, of the translators were government employees or academics who at the time were on government payrolls. So what this is telling you is that the private sector did not succeed in doing translations. Now, one of the things, uh, one of the things that uh, we also can see is that uh, there is a very strong correlation between Japanese uh, productivity growth in, in industries and uh, the relevance of British patents for those industries. So in order to, in order to uh, make this point, uh, what uh, we did was we looked at the word usages in British patents, and we looked at the word usages of, uh, in, of books that described how to make particular products, and we constructed a measure of similarity. So for example, if British patents uh, use words like locomotive a lot, uh, then they're going to be a lot more relevant for industries uh, like railroads uh, than they are going to be for industries uh, like rice farming. And so on this horizontal axis, uh, we have a measure of how much words used in describing how to make a particular product are 
uh, related or similar to words used in British patents. So industries over here are going to use words that are very similar to those in, in British patents and industries over here are gonna use very different words. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, industries uh, that use more similar words had faster rates of economic growth. Um, and again, part of what's going on in Japan is Japanese are making investments in um, learning uh, how to translate technical materials. And once they have the books and the teachers and the ability to read, uh, those industries are going to be the ones that are going to that are going to take off. Um, one of the things that we also see in these uh, in these in these data um, is that the productivity growth in other countries um, were not related to British patents. So essentially, something was going on in Japan that was not happening in other countries. So here on this plot, I have. Uh, annualized exporter productivity growth. And again, I have British patent relevance over here. Um, and this is each dot here corresponds to an industry in a different country in the 19th century. Uh, and we see that, um, uh, that um, other countries are not, be, are not able to read those British patents and in their own language and um, uh, adapt them to their uh, their own industries. So their productivity growth seems to be independent of what was happening in 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 other languages. Uh, in in sorry in in Britain. Uh, now you can ask why is that the case, and I think the answer is that uh, reading science in a in in English. Uh, is hard. You have to you have to learn how to uh, read English first, and then you have to learn the science. It's much easier if you can read uh, science in your own language. And one of the big innovations that the Japanese did, and this is uh, gives you the 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 reason why suddenly these translations uh, take off in the 1870s, is that the Japanese invested very heavily in technical dictionaries, um, which enabled them to translate. Uh, words like uh, locomotive into uh, words like kisha in Japanese. This type of investment uh, was not something that we've seen in other countries. And I think it helps to explain why Japan was able to grow as rapidly as it could in the, um, uh, in the 19th century. Um, we also can see in the data that uh, Japanese manufacturing productivity growth was quite high. And in fact, uh, in our estimates, um, manufacturing productivity growth was uh, around uh, the, the second highest or so uh, in our data set over here. Uh, only Hong Kong is a little bit higher. Uh, and that's largely due to the fact that uh, Hong Kong is is uh, essentially just a, a city in, uh, rather than a full country with a lot of agriculture in it. Um, but this rapid productivity growth that we see in Japan is, is quite uh, remarkable. Um, on the other hand, if we look at sectors like agriculture, which didn't benefit uh, nearly as much uh, from British technology, uh, we see that Japan had pretty much middling uh, productivity growth in agriculture in the 19th century. And again, this is suggesting that Japan is learning from Britain during this time period um, uh, in, in manufacturing, but it's not learning that much in, in agriculture. Fast forwarding another roughly 100 years, uh, we come to the end of uh, the Second World War, and we see a third globalization shock happen in, in Japan. Uh, here, I think that there are two big changes uh, that uh, mattered a lot for Japan. The first is that Japan adopted a new constitution uh, that was um, uh, uh, contained a lot of uh, American and other um, uh, uh, influences. Um, and Japan became a stable 
uh, democratic uh, country. Um, and I think that the elimination of the political instability of the pre-war period reduced the risk of war and made it seem safer to do investments. And we see uh, Japanese investment take off uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Uh, a second less talked about uh, globalization change was that uh, a large number of Japanese who had been living abroad, uh, roughly equal to around 10% of the Japanese population, returned to Japan. And these people um, often uh, carried with them many new ideas from their time living in China or Korea or uh, Southeast Asia. And so I think that improved Japanese government institutions coupled with a much more globalized workforce uh, may help explain not only why Japan caught up with its pre-war growth trend, but also why it converged with US standards of living. And just to make this point clear, I wanna just show you uh, Japanese economic growth in comparison. So the top line over here is showing you GDP per capita in 2004 dollars for the United States. And this lower line is showing you uh, the GDP per capita in Japan uh, over uh, the same time period. And so the difference between these two lines is telling you uh, the income gap. And one of the things that you can see is that roughly uh, uh, from, this, from the point of the Meiji Restoration uh, to uh, roughly 1990, uh, that gap between the U.S. and Japan has been uh, closing. Now, why did it close? Well, um, we can see that uh, in, in the United States, um, uh, growth uh, was seems to have risen in the post-war period. So this green line shows you the pre-war growth trend in GDP per capita. And you can see that consistently uh, incomes were higher than what you might have predicted based on uh, what was happening in the uh, early 20th century in the United States. But in Japan, we see that um, uh, not only did did, did growth rise in the post-war period, but that rise in growth was even faster than what we see in, in, in the United States. So that um, by 1960, uh, Japan's income per capita was higher than what you might have expected based on the pre-war uh, uh, growth trend, uh, but, it, but Japanese growth just continued uh, to rise uh, coming very close, roughly within about 20% of the U.S. Uh, by 1990. But then we start to see this divergence, and, and we've never really seen uh, Japan starting to diverge like that, uh, except during time periods of um, wars and other things in the, in the, in the earlier period. Um, so I want to zoom in on this, um, uh, which I do in this picture, so this is showing you uh, Japanese uh, GDP per work hour um, here. And, you, and in the top line, the yellow line, I have US GDP per work hour, and here's British GDP per work hour, and this is the whole EU. Um, and you can see that between 1970 and 1990, Japan was converging with the United States. This, this per capita income gap was, was shrinking. Uh, but then roughly around 1990, uh, we see that the gap starts to widen uh, with the United States. And in particular, we see that while US productivity growth has remained on a uh, fairly uh, similar trajectory after 1990, uh, there appears to be a slowdown in, in Japanese uh, productivity growth. Um, and in fact, today, uh, Japanese GDP per work hour is only 59% of that in the United States. And so what I want to talk about for the remainder of my, my talk is what has stopped that convergence process. So the first thing that I want to emphasize is that um, 
this is a long-term process. It's not going to be related to uh, changes in monetary policy. And it's also a relatively new uh, phenomenon for Japan. We have not seen uh, a failure to converge over a 30-year period at any time since the 1870s. Now, one answer that you that's popular in the media is that it that, that this slowdown is due to the bursting of the bubble and an aging economy. I'm kind of skeptical about that because usually the impact of bubbles on economic performance ends after 10 or at most 15 years. Um, and what's been happening in Japan has been, has been uh, continuing for 30 years. The second reason I, I, uh, I'm also skeptical of the notion that this is all being driven by an aging, uh, aging society, um, because the decline in the labor force certainly can bring down GDP, but it shouldn't bring down GDP per work hour, right? There's no particular reason that an individual worker uh, should become less productive because the workers around them are getting uh, uh, older. So one possible explanation uh, for this is that um, as, uh, uh, as Japan progressed through the 20th century, many of the more globalized Japanese uh, began to retire. As I had mentioned, after the end of the Second World War, there were many Japanese who had lived abroad and had international experience by the 1980s. Uh, these people were retiring out of the, the, the workforce, and uh, Japan became increasingly inward-looking uh, with relatively few Japanese going abroad, relatively few um, foreigners coming to Japan, and this may have caused Japan to, to miss important global trends and lower its economic rates of dynamism. So one of the things that I think is important for Japan to think about going forward is how, are, how can Japan raise productivity? And to answer a question like that, I wanna start by uh, giving a definition of what productivity is. Uh, essentially productivity is measured by economists to be the amount of output one gets for a given amount of input. So as one becomes more efficient, one can produce more with a given labor force. The same number of workers uh, results in higher sales. Now, as I've been arguing uh, for the past uh, 20 minutes or so, a hallmark of Japanese development has been the ability to learn technologies from abroad and then apply and develop them further. Um, and so in order to grow, uh, Japan's gonna need to improve the quality of its labor force and improve the allocation of its resources. Um, but one of the challenges I think that Japan faces is uh, that uh, it is struggling to develop frontier skill acquisition. And so let me try to be a little more precise about exactly what I mean by that. So the Japanese education system is uh, clearly one of the best in the world, uh, at least through high school. So here I'm just showing you some OECD data. So OECD is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And it's basically a uh, set of around uh, 30 countries that are the highest income countries in the world. And in this plot, uh, I show how Japanese high school students perform on standardized tests uh, in um, many of these high-income uh, countries. And you can see that Japan uh, is situated all the way at the upper right, uh, indicating that Japan has the highest average scores uh, for girls and boys in high school in the OECD. Uh, so that's quite impressive. And if I were to show you the same plot for mathematics, it would, it would come out equally impressive. Uh, so this uh, strongly suggests that Japanese high schools really do deliver a uh, well-trained uh, uh, labor force. 
But of course, in order to get frontier skills, you need more than high school education. Um, uh, so at a bare minimum, you need uh, some, some college education. But here again, we see that uh, Japanese uh, students uh, go to college at relatively high rates compared to uh, other countries. So here is Japan and here is the rest of the OECD. And you can see that college attendance rates in Japan are uh, around 65%. Uh, so roughly two thirds of all Japanese are getting some tertiary uh, or are getting some tertiary education. Uh, so it's not the problem is not that Japanese are not going to college at high rates, but where we start to see some big differences is when we look at um, the types of colleges that we have in. Uh, Japan relative to other countries. And here, uh, I want to make the point that Japanese universities um, uh, struggle for enough funding to do uh, cutting edge research. And to give you some sense of this, um, I uh, looked at some data from the Shanghai Academic Ranking of World Universities. Uh, so this is a ranking that uh, essentially looks at uh, the publication records and the citation counts of um, uh, uh, faculty at different universities in the world and uh, also uh, consults with, with experts about which universities are the most um, uh, uh, research active. And when you look at that uh, ranking, you see that only two Japanese universities, uh, the University of Tokyo and Kyoto University, are in the top 100 in the Shanghai ranking, with Tokyo holding a rank of 24 and Kyoto holding a rank of 41. So there just aren't that many uh, universities in Japan that are in the top 100. And so this raises a question, why? Japan Japanese students are clearly quite capable. Um, uh, and uh, Japanese go to university at high rates, why is it that Japan doesn't um, uh, do that well in these international rankings? And I think the main problem is that Japanese universities are underfunded. Uh, and that's going to come from two sources. Uh, one, uh, probably most students in the room are going to be unhappy about this. Uh, uh, tuition is very low in uh, Japan compared to, say, the United States. Uh, for example, uh, the average uh, tuition at a U.S. public university is about uh, 1.3 million yen. And if you go to a private university, it's around uh, 5 million yen. And some of the elite universities are much more expensive uh, than this. Uh, and that tuition helps fund uh, uh, the kinds of research that uh, professors end up doing. Um, the second and perhaps uh, even bigger problem is that uh, government support uh, for universities uh, is also uh, low and alumni donations are also low. Uh, and you can kind of see the discrepancies by just looking at some data on, on endowments which are the, the um, assets held by the uh, universities. Uh, US, if you look, if you sum across all US universities, uh, the total value of all of their endow endowments is 93.5 trillion yen. Uh, so Japan is uh, in the process of creating a national endowment fund. Uh, but when you look at that, uh, the amount of money is only about 10 trillion yen. So the US, uh, 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 the U.S. has around three times the number of people. So uh, on a per capita basis, uh, the amount of money that's available in terms of endowments is around one third uh, that of the United States in Japan. Um, and uh, when universities don't have the, the uh, funding necessary to um, recruit internationally mobile fa faculty, uh, you end up um, having a hard time retaining um, top science uh, uh, faculty. Uh, 
Um, and just to give you uh, a sense about where the global market is for uh, academics, um, I just want to give an example, uh, since I'm an economist, of economists starting salaries. Uh, so in the United States, starting salaries for economists at PhD granting academic institutions are around 19 million yen. This is a starting salary. Um, and that's about two to three times the level in Japan. And what that means is that uh, obviously Japanese universities can attract uh, Japanese professors who want to live in Japan, but if a professor is willing to live abroad, they can often make uh, far more money uh, at a foreign university than in Japan. And so that affects uh, the ability of these universities to recruit top talent. So then you may ask, well, does the quality of a college education matter for anything? Um, and here uh, we, we see, at least in the United States, uh, the answer appears to be yes, uh, that if you look at uh, the types of materials uh, and the types of topics that are taught by top researchers in their classrooms relative to uh, the materials that are, that are taught by professors who are not top researchers, you see some systematic uh, differences. Uh, in particular, um, controlling for academic discipline and course level, we find that research active instructors teach much more frontier knowledge uh, than um, non-research active instructors. Uh, we also see that the dissemination of frontier knowledge through courses is strongly and positively related to students' labor market outcomes and their ability to innovate in the future. That is, it's probably not an accident that Silicon Valley is located near Stanford and Berkeley or that a lot of biotech companies are located near, um, uh, near Harvard and MIT. Uh, this is related to the types of instruction that they're getting um, uh, in those colleges, and then they find jobs um, in related industries in that uh, in those in those areas. Um, thus, as far as we can measure it in the United States, going to a university with research active fa faculty matters for what you learn and how well you do. Um, we also can see that Japan is a big outlier, at least relative to much of the OECD, in terms of post-tertiary education. So what I mean by that are master's degrees and PhDs. Uh, so uh, the circle, uh, the, the ovals uh, on this picture uh, show you the fraction of Japanese who get either a master's or a PhD, uh, and also the fraction in the United States. And you can see uh, that um, roughly, um, uh, the, or, or the rate at which Japanese are going on for higher level uh, degrees, that is post-college degrees, is uh, roughly half that of what we have in the, in the United States. And again, when you're thinking about uh, getting the skill set necessary to do complex uh, computer programming or um, uh, financial engineering or things like that, uh, Japan is just not producing uh, the MBAs or the technical training um, that uh, is being provided in other, other countries. Um, Relatedly, we can also see uh, that Japanese seem to have some struggles in um, interacting with foreigners. Um, and here I wanna just show some evidence about uh, the types of innovations that we're seeing happening in Japan. Uh, so Japan is number one in terms of uh, the number of uh, patent filings it does. Um, Japan files more patents, uh, triadic patents, which are patents that are filed in, in all three major patent offices. So these are the most important patents. Uh, it files more of these triadic patents than any other OECD country. Um, and Japan is also in the 
top five uh, within the OECD in patent applications for biotechnology and information and communications technology. So clearly Japanese are able to do this type of, of research. That's not the issue. But where you start to see some real differences is that Japanese researchers appear not to cooperate that much with foreigners. So Japan is in the bottom five countries in the OECD in terms of international co-authorship of patents and international co-inventing. So I think what that's uh, telling us is that um, uh, Japan is having a hard, or Japanese are having a hard time interacting uh, with foreigners. And to the extent you interact less, uh, you're less likely to learn from foreigners. Um, and this relates back to my earlier point about um, English uh, capability, translating uh, uh, documents um, and translating technology into Japanese. Uh, we see globally that English ability is strongly uh, correlated with per capita income. So I'm just showing you a plot here in which I have the gross national income per capita on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, excuse me, and uh, the English proficiency score of each country uh, on standardized tests on the horizontal axis. Uh, and you can see that in general, uh, countries that have better um, uh, English capabilities uh, tend to have higher incomes. And Japan, uh, Japan does relatively well, uh, does extremely well given its English proficiency score. Um, but uh, clearly uh, you can see that on average, uh, countries that, that can speak English better uh, have higher incomes. Uh, and this kind of suggests that maybe if, if Japan could improve its English training, uh, it would be able to cooperate more on, on patent engineering and uh, innovations and things like that. So again, I think that this is a, uh, uh, an area or a challenge for Japan going forward, uh, trying to work out how to uh, improve the training of English um, uh, so that Japanese can, can better understand uh, technical materials. Uh, another area where uh, Japan looks like a really big uh, outlier um, is that Japan has very low levels of immigration. Uh, so this is a plot for the OECD showing you the share of the foreign-born population in 2017 uh, in the OECD. Um, and you can see that uh, among OECD countries, Japan is the second lowest in terms of uh, immigration. Uh, the reason that I'm putting this plot up uh, uh, here is because uh, one thing that's also been documented is that people learn from immigrants, that immigrants um, uh, come in uh, to your country, they have different ways of doing things, uh, and uh, you, can, you can learn things from people who, who have different approaches uh, to solving economic problems. And indeed, we saw at the end of the Second World War that when a uh, large number of Japanese immigrants came back in, we see that big boom uh, happened. Um, potentially, uh, uh, Japan is suffering from uh, the fact that uh, there are not a lot of ways in which uh, foreign ideas uh, can uh, can enter Japan, or it's, or it's harder uh, because of the English barriers and uh, the lack of contact with uh, foreigners, be it either through immigration or uh, uh, be it through Japanese uh, traveling abroad. Um, one of the other big differences, and, and this is where you start to see some, some quantitative impacts, is that um, Whereas much of the OECD uh, has been focusing on services, so here you can think about internet startups or you can think about financial engineering, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, OECD, um, uh, um, uh, so, so in, in the typical OECD uh, economy, um, approximately 40% of all uh, 
R and D expenditures or by businesses um, are driven by service uh, providers. In Japan, that number is much uh, smaller. So the Japanese are not investing very much in in services. Um, similarly, we also see whoops, uh, that um, Japan's small and medium enterprises look very different than those in the OECD. In particular, um, in the typical OECD country, uh, small and medium enterprises are doing a lot of research and development. Um, but in Japan, small and medium enterprises are not uh, doing that much. And this, uh, this high rate in the United States, in, in, in the OECD, uh, is coming from the fact that uh, many of these small and medium enterprises are startups that are uh, pursuing new ideas in biotech or, or, or computer science or, or what have you. Now, these low investments in services have resulted in uh, low productivity growth in uh, services relative to manufacturing. So this, this plot here shows productivity growth in Japan uh, between 1994 and 2018 in manufacturing, which is the upper line, and in services. And you can see that, that Japan has done quite well in terms of manufacturing uh, productivity. Um, and many of Japanese manufacturing companies are world renowned uh, like Toyota, but Japan has not done uh, so well in, in services. Um, and uh, since services are a much larger fraction of the Japanese economy and indeed all OECD economies, uh, this helps to explain some of the low uh, productivity growth that we're seeing in Japan. Um, we also see in Japan that government support for research and development is also quite meager, and, and that uh, lines up with uh, the low levels of support for Japanese universities. In fact, uh, Japan is in the bottom five of the OECD in terms of R&D support. Um, now, interestingly, what we do see uh, uh, happening a lot in Japan is that the government provides relatively high levels of support for small and medium enterprises. Uh, if you recall, Japanese small and medium enterprises look very different uh, than small and medium enterprises in, in other OECD countries in that they don't do much uh, research and development. Um, um, so the so what, what uh, when the government is supporting these uh, SMEs in Japan, they're not encouraging them to uh, do research and development uh, like we're seeing in other countries. Um, and as a result, the character of small and medium firms in Japan uh, looks very different than what we see in the United States and other OECD countries. In particular, they're much older than average. So why might this matter? Well, uh, Joseph Schumpeter uh, famously argued that uh, innovation happens through creative destruction. That is, uh, whenever you have an innovation, uh, you create a new product and that tends to displace an old product or an old firm. So at one point there were uh, companies that would make uh, horse-drawn carriages. Those companies have all ceased to exist and they've been replaced by uh, car companies or train companies, etc. Um, but this creative destruction is at the core of technological progress. And what we see in Japan is that uh, Japan exhibits much less firm destruction. Um, one way of thinking about this is that uh, I'd like to say most US small firms are startups, most Japanese small firms are end-ups. And to give you a sense about what that means, uh, in the United States, uh, less than half of all small firms are more than 10 years old. So in other words, in the United States, firms are created and either they innovate and grow or they die. Um, and so that's why you see relatively few old uh, small firms. 
However, in Japan, 75% of all small firms are uh, over 10 years old. So these are firms that have been around for a long time, um, but they're not growing. Um, uh, and so they're likely to have very low productivity growth. Uh, but we don't just uh, uh, see that government support uh, props up firms in Japan that are uh, inefficient. Uh, we also see that uh, Japan exhibits um, a lot less firm creation. Um, and I want to share with you what I think is a remarkable fact about uh, Japan and the United States. Uh, if you look at the top five companies in terms of stock market capitalization in each country, so stock market capitalization is the value of the equity of um, uh, each of these companies, uh, you see that four out of the five um, top firms in the United States were founded in the last 50 years. So these firms would be Apple or Microsoft or Alphabet, which is uh, more uh, owns Google uh, and Amazon. So these are all relatively young firms in the United States. If you look at the top five um, firms in terms of market capitalization in Japan, you find that none of them were founded in the last 50 years. So the, so the giants in Japan are much older firms um, that have been around for a long time. You're not getting that, that creative destruction. You're not creating uh, 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 many new big companies and you're not destroying inefficient uh, older companies. Another area where you can see that um, uh, Japan can improve uh, its productivity growth, I think, is uh, by uh, working more towards improving diversity. So in the United States, uh, this has been a very uh, long and difficult process, um, but research, recent research on the sources of US productivity growth uh, point to the important role played by uh, reducing discrimination. Um, and the basic idea here, uh, why it is that uh, diversity can, can improve productivity, is that if you think that, say, men and women are born uh, equally smart on average, uh, then if you've got an economy that only chooses the best man for a job, um, on average, uh, you're going to have worse workers than if you hire the best person for the job, right? Because if you're just choosing the best man, uh, you're going to be overlooking highly qualified uh, women um, for the same type of, of job. Um, and so uh, uh, because of that basic uh, premise, uh, the fact that managerial positions are skewed towards men uh, and in the United States skewed towards certain racial groups, uh, this can have uh, fairly large adverse productivity effects. Um, and just to give you some sense about uh, some recent estimates of that, uh, if we look at uh, US growth rates over a 50 year period from 1960 to 2010, uh, people have estimated that reductions in discriminatory frictions um, have lowered uh, the share of white men among managers, doctors, and lawyers from around 90% to 60%. So what that means is that in 1960, most of those uh, elite uh, types of, of positions were held by uh, white men. By 2010, um, uh, only 60% uh, were held by, by white men. Um, so what this indicates is that uh, there's been substantial progress in improving diversity. We still have a long way to go, but there's definitely has been big progress in getting other types of people into top positions. Um, and when we estimate the impact of this on U.S. per capita GDP growth, uh, uh, reasonable estimates suggest that around 40% of U.S. per capita growth uh, has been due to this phenomenon. 
So another way of saying that is that um, a major problem with discrimination is not just that it's unfair and morally problematic, but it's also economically very costly. Um, and what we see for Japan is that Japan has been a lot slower in making progress at um, giving these kinds of advantages uh, to women. And I want to talk a little more about that uh, in, in on the next slide. So uh, as I was mentioning, Japan has lagged behind other countries in fully employing women. So um, Japanese women have very high labor force participation rates. In fact, Japanese women work at higher rates than um, uh, American women do. But there are some really important differences in men's and women's labor market experience. Uh, as the media has often reported, uh, the proportion of female managers among all managers in Japan is about half that of the average OECD country. In fact, only Korea has a lower ratio uh, within the OECD. So what characterizes uh, uh, female labor force participation in Japan is that they have high labor force participation rates, but very few of them become managers. So in, in some sense, Japan today looks a lot like the United States in 1960, in which um, uh, the, the top levels of managers are uh, largely men, um, and women have yet to uh, break into those ranks in large numbers. Moreover, we see that um, the proportional difference between men's and women's wages in Japan is the third highest in the OECD. So in other words, men uh, in Japan typically earn uh, uh, significantly more than women, uh, even relative to other OECD countries. Um, on the, on the flip side, we also see that um, uh, Japanese men do very little household work, which adds a burden to Japanese women. On average, Japanese women spend three more hours a day on household chores uh, than men do. Um, there's definitely a gap here in the United States, but the gap is only half as large in the United States. So again, if you think that um, men and women are on average equally talented, then the fact that uh, Japanese women are unable to participate in um, uh, top level uh, positions points to a fairly substantial inefficiency in the Japanese economy. Um, that said, uh, you know, Japan uh, is, is uh, I don't want to leave you with with uh, the impression that I'm just being critical of Japan. There are many areas in which uh, Japan has done uh, is is a model for other countries. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, the Japanese uh, healthcare system and um, uh, uh, longevity is uh, something that. Uh, many countries envy. Uh, in 2020, Japanese life expectancy was close to 85 years as opposed to 77 years in the United States. So that's uh, an additional uh, almost eight years of, uh, of life. That's quite impressive. Um, despite the criticisms that people have made about co Japan's COVID policy, uh, the per capita COVID death rate in Japan um, was uh, uh, 140th that of the United States. Uh, the US uh, uh, is clearly a more, uh, has a lot more crime than Japan. The homicide rate in Japan is 19 times uh, higher uh, than, than uh, Japan. Um, and Japan has done uh, relatively well in terms of uh, inequality. Uh, so people in the top 20% of earners in the United States earn eight times more than people in the bottom 20%. Uh, but in Japan, those numbers are uh, around 6%. So again, uh, uh, Japan's social safety net has worked uh, reasonably well to, to um, 
uh, maintain more income um, equality. But I think the, the, the challenge going forward remains similar to, to that in the Meiji period, uh, which is how do we maintain the great things about Japan while adopting uh, the best practices uh, from the West? Um, so to finish up, I want to uh, leave you with a couple of, of takeaways. Um, I think the first is that globalization and learning from abroad have characterized all three of Japan's uh, historic economic booms. Uh, so we saw that in the Asuka boom, where they learned from China, the Meiji boom, where they learned from um, Britain and the United States. Um, and we also saw that in the post-war boom, where uh, the American occupation brought in um, a better form of government and uh, the, the return of the migrants uh, may have helped uh, Japan uh, absorb foreign ideas. Um, and again, uh, Japanese like to think that it's a Japan is a relatively close society, but I would argue that Japan has been remarkable in its ability to absorb and adapt foreign technology. Um, and I think that that strategy still has uh, relevance for, for today. And I think that there are a couple of key areas uh, where globalized learning can really help Japan. And I think uh, the first is uh, raising English language ability to foster technology transfer. If you can communicate more easily in English, if you can uh, access English language documents more easily, uh, that is, is just going to make it easier to absorb uh, foreign, uh, foreign ideas and adapt them to Japan. Um, a second big challenge is uh, to improve services productivity growth rates. Uh, and here, um, I think policy needs to focus less on keeping uh, small enterprises um, that are not doing innovative things um, uh, alive and um, uh, allow some of those, those businesses to, to fail so that the workers can move to companies that are going to be um, uh, more efficient. Um, and then uh, probably the single biggest thing that Japan could do is to uh, employ women more efficiently. We see, we saw in the United States that um, uh, reducing uh, discrimination accounted for around 40% of US productivity growth. Uh, if Japan could um, realize some of those gains by improving the position of its women, uh, that uh, that could dramatically increase uh, productivity growth in, in Japan. So I want to thank you uh, for sitting through my, my presentation. Um, uh, and I want to wish you all the best of luck uh, in the future.